church. It is a joy to have you here worshiping our God in Christ with us this day. Beloved in Christ announcements for the benefit of the body of Christ this day. First, a very big thank you to everyone who participated in our cleanup day yesterday. Friends, I hope that you take the time to enjoy and savor and appreciate these beautiful chandeliers in here. <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and be our guest. Come and dwell amongst us. Focus our hearts and our minds this day on that which truly matters, on that which never fails, on that which is love, that which is peace, that which satisfies the salvation and the joy that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Therefore, we will not fear 
though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day, nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. God lifts God's voice in their hearts.
which you can see is going to be a little bit different today. We are going to share the peace of Christ with one another. And so, Sarah Jane, it's um, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And then we say, and also with you, by going, and also with you. All right. And so, friends, I would invite you to stand as able and as you feel comfortable and turn to your neighbor and silently share the peace of Christ with one another.
friends, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day and indeed every day, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Israel really can use a monarchy. The reasons for a monarchy are legion. First, Israel is growing. They are settled into this land of promise. They have not been wandering the desert for quite a few generations at this point. Therefore, what comes with geographical stability? Well, children. There's a lot of Israelites. The children have children who have children who have children. They have grown. And in fact, there are too many Israelites at this point for the village structure, this judge structure, to work. The population boom. It requires a larger governmental system, a, a monarchy. For their time, for their place, for their size, it makes sense. So first, monarchy, it's a good idea, their population has grown. Second, Israel can use a monarchy because Israel really needs help managing its economy. With growth in human numbers, the economy is becoming more complex. The village system isn't cutting it anymore. Give them a monarchy. Third, to quote the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary, <laughs> Quote, new patterns of land consolidation and political power necessitate a strong, centralized system to protect Israel's emerging vested interests. End quote. I'll believe them. It makes logical sense. For logical reasons, in a logical world, with logical arguments, they need a monarchy. But none of these logical reasons are the actual reason that Israel asks for the monarchy. No, from today's reading, for you're the ones who read it, do you remember why Israel wants a monarchy? It's the in thing. It's the in thing, thank you. Everyone else has one. Everyone else has a monarchy. Everyone else has one is what civic engagement worker, organizer Peter Block calls a consumer mentality. Israel gazes upon the world around them like a Gen X kid with a Toys R Us Christmas catalog. On page one, there's a photograph, and it's of the Philistines playing with their god, Dagon. Oh, Dagon is cool! Dagon has these super fun feasts. And Dagon has a temple, and Dagon is like really neat because he has this shrine, and they want a shrine too, and the shrine has an elevator, and it's really awesome. Please, God, can we have a Dagon? Please, please, God, can we have what the Philistines have? Ooh, ooh, on page seven, there's the super duper good looking people of Moab. All the men are good looking, all the women are strong, and all the children are above average. <laughs> God, can we please marry the Moabites, please? Everyone else gets to marry Moabites. But then there's the hot ticket item, the Tickle Me Elmo of the year. That one thing everyone else has, but the Israelites don't. And they want it. A king. Give me, God, please. Give me, give me, give me. Everyone else has a king. We promise to be really good. We'll follow all ten commandments. We'll give up on Dagon. We'll stop looking at the Moabites. We'll never ask for anything ever, ever again. Just please give us a king. The Israelites are consumers. They look at the world around them like, like it's a catalog, looking for what they want that others have. It is a consumer mentality. And you know... I know that consumer mentality is going to let them down again and again and again. To pray, paraphrase Samuel, a king doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. No, he takes and he takes and he takes. The king is not going to make them happy. The consumer mentality never does. The Israelites 
would have done well to have watched the film adaptation of Roald Dahl's classic, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Many of you might remember uh, Veruca Salt. Veruca, from the 1970s version of the film, arguably the only version of the film. <laughs> Veruca is this wealthy girl, roughly 11 years old. She receives news of these five golden tickets scattered amongst the world, these five golden tickets located in these Willy Wonka chocolate bars. It is a luxury that Veruca doesn't have. And if Veruca doesn't have it, she wants it. How wealthy is this child? Well, she tells her father that she wants this, and her father says, okay, opens an entire factory's worth of employees to do nothing but unwrap Willy Wonka chocolate bars all day long looking for that golden ticket. Naturally, the golden ticket is found, and Veruca wins the prize. She gets to tour Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. And what does she do during that entire tour? She tells her father what she wants. She wants everything factory. Veruca has a consumer mentality. She is never satisfied. She wants more, more, more. She compares what she has to what others have and finds that what she has is never enough. Veruca compares and despairs. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for the Israelites 3,000 years ago. It's not healthy for Veruca, who eventually falls down a garbage chute. <laughs> It's not healthy for us. The consumer mentality, the comparing what we have to what others have, is a despairing mentality. We will never be satisfied. We will always compare and despair. The opposite of a consumer mindset is a citizen mindset. It is what Peter Block calls the citizen way. He quotes people who live by a citizen mindset as saying things like, quote, our community takes care of each other. We know our neighbors, and our neighbors know us. We know how to do without. We can make ends meet, make do. We do this together. We are storytellers in our community. I tell you my story, and I listen to yours. Block writes, quote, these are people who are less dependent on the material culture and its requirements and its call. They think they have enough. Their mindset is abundance, not scarcity. Their way to the good life is not through consumption. It is instead a path that they make by walking it with those who surround them. It is the way of a community, recognizing its abundance. The place to look for care is in the dense relationships of local neighbors and community groups. In short, the citizen way is the way modeled by Jesus Christ in his creation of the church. The church gathers after Pentecost. Jesus has ascended into heaven. He sends his Holy Spirit. The church is gathered, and the book of Acts tells us, in Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, all the believers lived in wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pulled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal, a celebration, exuberant, joyful. They were praising God. People in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added to those who were saved. This is who we're called to be. This is who the Israelites were called to be. To be citizens of God's kingdom. The Lord our God never calls us to become consumers. God knows consumerism isn't going to satisfy us. The Lord our God never calls us to compare ourselves with what others have. God's wise. God knows comparing leads to despairing. God knows, friends, what will satisfy us. God knows the antidote to despair. The antidote is community, the citizen way. In our day-to-day -day life, the citizen way takes many forms. One form is that offered by author Joe Chittister. She writes, try saying this silently to everyone 
and everything you see for 30 days and see what happens to your own soul. Say to everyone and everything you see for 30 days, silently, I wish you happiness now and whatever will bring you happiness in the future. If we set it to the sky, we would have to stop polluting. If we set it when we see the ponds and lakes and streams, well, we would have to stop using them as garbage dumps and sewers. If we set it to people, well then we would have to stop stoking the fires of enmity around us. Human warmth would take root in us like a clear, hot June day. We would change. This is just one example of living the citizen way. This is one example of what it looks like to be truly satisfied. Thanks be to God in Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be 
careful of the cords up here in front. Good morning. During uh, Lent, our mission commission, led by Jody Colby, sponsored Wednesday evening uh, Lenten suppers. Each Wednesday evening, we heard from a different mission group. One of the ones that we heard from was the Garfield Community Farms. Garfield Community Farms, founded in 2009 and located in the Garfield section of Pittsburgh, seeks to demonstrate God's restorative creation through urban agriculture in the community. It was started on three acres of abandoned and degraded urban land and has become one of the area's most productive and active farms. The farm practices its mission using three focuses. The first, to provide affordable and fresh produce to our neighbors. Developing an ecologically regenerative approach to urban uh, agriculture and providing educational opportunities around gardening, ecology, and nutrition. You can take um, groups, different volunteer groups to go and help and also they will sponsor different groups for schools so that they can teach about this urban method of farming. On Saturday, April the 10th, a beautiful sunny spring morning, 15 multi-generational members of the Shuck community joined AJ, the farm's community engagement coordinator, who showed us how we could be of service to the farm. Each of us was assigned an area where we could work for the next two hours. Some of us transplanted tomato seedlings, various types, into individual pots that would then, then go into the greenhouse under grow lights and eventually ending up as plants for sale either at the farm or the farmer's market. Another group got to thin the turnip patch. Another group got to weed and prepare the gardens for planting. A fence needed to be repaired so our head repairman, Mr. Fleming, was able to fix that. Another part of the group, mainly the young boys, worked on the pathway around the labyrinth. There certainly was no shortage of work to be done. As we gathered for our group picture at the end of our volunteer shift, we all expressed a feeling of gratitude that we were to able to be of service to a local mission that provides help to so many. And never having been there before, never really having been to Garfield before, I was glad to be a part of this. And if you're thinking about you might like to do something outside, I'm sure if you called, they would welcome your help. And now that I'm also doing a minute for mission, I would like to say thank you very much to the Bell Choir. The music that you provide is such a, a beautiful part of the service. Thank you very much for your hard work and your beautiful service.
Friends, God is good. God hears our prayers. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Holy Lord, we see your blessings around us every day. We see so much goodness, and we have so much to be thankful for, for your love, for your compassion, for your grace, for your mercy. And God, we lift up to you silently now our personal, private prayers of rejoicing and thanksgiving. To you be the honor and the glory and the praise, O Lord. Holy God, we lift up to you those concerns which weigh upon our hearts. We pray this day for those who are in need of your healing touch. We continue to pray for Jerry Phillips, for Judy Catanzaro, for Virginia Jones. God, we pray your healing touch upon those who need to be healed physically, who need emotional and mental healing and spiritual healing, dear Lord. God, we pray for those who are mourning at this time, for the family of Sally Johnson. God, wrap your loving arms around them. Remind them of the hope of the promise of the resurrection. Holy God, we bring before you our prayers for our mission co-workers, the Reverend Mark Adams and Miriam Maldonado Escobar and their children serving at the U.S.-Mexico border. God, we pray for all of those mission workers who are helping with those in immigration. God, be with them. We lift up in prayer our sister church in Lichenza, Malawi, praying your particular blessing upon them this day, and praying your blessing upon Pabatso, our World Vision-sponsored child. And God, we ask that you would bless all those who are having to make very difficult decisions in leadership as we continue to navigate this pandemic. We pray for all decision makers, leaders, both in our churches and denominations, as well as um, governmental um, leaders. We pray, dear Lord, that you would grant them wisdom and discernment. Holy Lord, we pray for those men and women serving our nation in harm's way, both locally and abroad. And God, we pray that you'd protect them, bring them home, be with their families as they wait, and God, we pray that you would be with those whom they are called to serve. We continue to lift before you, dear Lord, the division and the fraction in our nation. And particularly, dear Lord, our ongoing struggle with racism. God, we pray that you would create healing, that you would use us for your service, that we may all be one in this world, dear God, even as you are one and that you may use us for the service of your peace. Holy God, go with us into this new week. Guide all that we think, all that we say, all that we do, that in thought, word, and deed we may glorify you. And now, quietly, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We receive the gifts of our tithes and our offerings in various different ways, um, Elder Mary Abbott will be standing at the exit at the front of the sanctuary with a basket to receive our tithes and our offerings. We also can give by um, sending in our tithe or offering to the church. If you go to shupchurch.org, you will find all kinds of information about what's happening at the church. It is updated by Ryan Gracie. He takes very good care of it. So you can find there our Tithely app to be able to give online. And so that is how we are giving these days. And friends, God is so good, and we are invited to respond to God's goodness with our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray a prayer of dedication of those. Holy Lord, receive these, the gifts of our tithes and our offerings, for the sake of your glory and for the sake of your kingdom. Amen. And now let us stand as able for the doxology. <laughs>
Friends, we are going to do things a little bit differently today for departing the sanctuary. I believe that you are grown-ups and you make wise and safe decisions. And so, instead of me going pew by pew dismissing you, I am trusting you. So what we do for when we depart is Elderberry Abbott stands at the front of the sanctuary because we depart going down through the, through the front of the sanctuary and then down the steps and then out to the parking lot. She will be standing there and then I would invite you, the first pew, to stand and, and then depart and, and then the next. And what I want you to do is pay attention. Once that line gets shorter, then it's your turn to come forward to maintain physical distancing. We want to maintain physical distancing in, in our departure. And then, as I always say, once you get to the parking lot, you do your thing. But my goal is to keep you safe and that physically distanced and masked on our way out until then, so that I can say I did my job. Did my due diligence and kept you all safe. And I'll be standing here by the communion table to greet you as you depart. Now, friends, I would invite you to rise as able to receive the blessing, and we will, um, as you feel comfortable doing so, put out our, our arms, as I understand is historically how this church receives the blessing. And now, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace now and forevermore. Alleluia, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen.